Hey guys, Wadok Studios here, and today um, we're going to go through part four of the Return to Retro series. Um, so quick recap, um, in part one of Return to Retro we covered textures, filtering, and MIPS. In part two we covered fake volumetrics, in which um, I went through setup of this fake volumetric um, effect here that fades on distance um, and is really cheap to render and then in part three we went through light cost optimization um, again just a quick recap we are in deferred rendering but most of these methods that I'm using will work in forward other than the fact that I wanted software ray tracing lumen GI um, we are in DirectX 11. This also works in Vulkan. Um, and we are in Shader Model SM5. With that, you can see the, the cost here is extremely cheap. Um, in the previous episode, we talked about normal um, cascade, directional light, and how you can offset some of your dynamic shadow casting cost with distance fields versus paying for it on this you know the cascade shadow map uh, rendering pass so you can fall back to distance fields at a certain distance um, still casting shadow maps really close and then i talked about how point lights use shadow maps and the resolution will fall off based on distance. Um, but you're still going to pay for that shadow casting uh, cost. Uh, in addition to, if we go to the optimization view mode um, and we go to light complexity, you're going to pay for this in uh, this, this basically light calculation the deferred g buffer for where these la uh, lights are overlapping and the more shadow maps you have overlapping each other also the more expensive that cost is going to be so in the previous episode we showed uh, optimized points which uses distance fields to cast shadows um, and then uses a player detector to swap between distance field and shadow maps so that you can still get um, shadow maps casted from the skeletal mesh within a certain range of the light um, but still fall back to distance field for the the cheaper uh, shadow casting method um, when you're not within range in this episode um, I'm actually going to show you, this was essentially like the worst case scenario if you wanted realistic physically based lighting that would cast shadows as each one of these point lights presented. However, in retro based workflows, you won't really have this many lights in the scene overlapping each other. And this is where I want to introduce the um, optimized field lights. So what we've done here is we've used our optimized blueprint that we created, this BP optimized point light. I've set the color and the annotation radius for the player detection. However, if you look at the light, you'll see what I've done, if I can get it clicked, um, is I've scaled its um, source length to its maximum value and what that essentially does is it allows you to take that point light and stretch it across a range so that the light that it generates covers multiple of these candles and if we go into the optimization view mode and we look at the light complexity you'll see that the overlapped area on the shader is far like drastically cheaper than where we were coming from um, however if you look at the lit mode you'll see that we still get the same coverage across the wall 
that you would expect from all of these individual candles. The trade-off here is that we're still using distance fields with this detector, so we'll still cast shadows, but um, the light is not going to be physically accurate to each one of these candles. So it'll come from this point light here and then here, and that's where the shadow casting is going to essentially come from um, for each one of these light sources. Now, if we go walk through this zone, you'll see that for a, a you know a retro based game, um, this is essentially going to likely be good enough. If you look down the road there at the distance field based lighting, um, you're not gonna necessarily need to be that physically accurate with your shadow casters in this type of a, a lighting scenario and simply casting shadows in this area is going to come off like it's good enough um the other thing you'll notice is that even though i don't have a point light on each one of these candles um you can see that i have this uh bloom effect or this glare effect that is reminiscent of uh, old school retro rendering techniques and um yeah so for today's episode i'm going to take you through how i created that so if you look here you'll see that like essentially there's this card that we have are this plane that we have um that is just kind of like in the area of the glowing candle you will also see that there's a flicker on the material um and they're pretty much you know in sync with each other um there will be a way to randomize this um but for my use case and for most games if you go look uh, the less randomization you have on the GPU, the cheaper the cost is going to be. And as you can see, we're approaching 200 frames a second um, in this area. So it's really cheap to do this. Uh, if we go look at the material, I'll leave this up on the screen a little bit for you so you can see what I've done here. But essentially, in your engine content folder, you're going to find this TEV light beam fall off. So it's just going to be under engine, engine volumetrics, the same place that we grab the fake volumetric for the light beam um, that we did, you know, that volumetric flashlight type beam here. It's in the same area. So I grab that texture and I multiply it by a time into a sine node with some noise. This noise is what kind of creates that randomized flicker add it with a value of one and clamp it. And then you're going to multiply that by the vertex color. This is going to come into play later. Um, and then you're going to offset the camera, like the world position of the material towards the camera. And you're going to do that by like a value of 20. And what that does is essentially pushes the material here, this plane, out towards the camera a little bit so it doesn't intersect with the object that it's rendering in front of but yet it's still pivoting based on the center point of where the material is um, next in line you're just gonna go create a blueprint class and pick an actor and then give it a name like fake bloom so we'll go look at this You'll notice there's no code here. This is a very simple effect. Um, you're essentially going to add a, a material billboard and you're going to make it the root of this actor. And then on the material billboard on the right hand side, um, you're going to see this elements and you're going to see an index. And this is where you would set the material. You're also going to see a distance to opacity curve and a distance to size curve and you'll note that I have my size set to 150. Now 
where these curves come into play, and if we go in the blueprint here, you can see them. Um, at a value of zero on a distance to size, I have 0 0.5. At 3,500, I have 0.13. And then on the distance to opacity at zero, I have 0 0.5. And then at 3500, I have 0 0.625. And the distance to size curve is going to work on the size of this. As you can see, if we hover over this, it's going to say a curve that maps the distance on the x axis to the sprite size on the y. So it takes it takes the um, this size and it multiplies it by the distance to size curve and that just works. But if you were to apply the distance to opacity curve without having this vector color for the alpha channel multiplied into your function, the opacity would not work. So that's something that you need to make note of. Um, and essentially the effect that you get based on this is the closer I get to this material, the opacity starts to uh, come down a bit and the size comes down a bit. So that's how we're getting that effect of like when you're far away, you can really see it as you get closer to it. It kind of fades off a little bit. Um, and it's based on the camera position, not the player. So that's how that works. Um, the further away you get, it's going to get bigger. Um, the closer you get, it's going to, it's going to kind of fall off. Um, yeah. And you can play around with those values and get them to where you feel they should be or what makes the most sense for you. Um, and this works really well for this re retro aesthetic because you don't, you know, because we're spacing our point lights out here, we're not really going to be able to rely on a realistic bloom. Um, I mean, we technically could rely on a bloom from an emissive material. Um, so you could do that, but I mean, you're still applying a material. You're still going to have to do the rotation value, et cetera, et cetera. And then you're going to pay for like the additive glow or bloom effect that you're going to have. Another thing to note here is if we go back to the material, you'll notice that the material blend mode that I'm using is additive. You could technically use translucent, but for us additive works really well. And it's also a, a cheaper shader cost than if you know we were to switch over to a full translucent shader. Um, so you'll see you're paying a little bit more instructions on the base. Um, but if we go to additive, those instruction counts are gonna come down. The other thing you'll notice is that I'm unlit. There's no reason to use a lit um material here um because it is an emissive color we technically could multiply this a little bit and add that glowy bloom um just give it like a an emissive power basically and we can do like 10 here and you can see like you know, it's gonna give you that extra little glow. So, I mean, the this really is, and I mean, if you're using software ray trace lumen like I am, then you'll also get the side effect of the glow um, from the lumen GI that's gonna come with it. However, I just prefer for this fake effect to, you know, not feed into the Lumen GI and come off a little bit more subtle and natural. Um, I just feel like this look is a little better. Um, another thing I probably should cover is that the material billboard is going to naturally rotate toward the camera. You don't have to worry about that. You just 
basically place it right on the center of the thing that you want to have the glow effect. Um, and whatever you're putting your glow effect effect in front of the thickness of the object. So this little cylinder here, that's how much you're going to want to push that material out on the camera offset. So like just to show you guys, if I was to set this back to zero, this avoids this clipping that you see with the, with the material, um, you know, so you may not have to offset this guy towards the camera at all in your situation. Um, I just wanted to cover this in the material for you just in case whatever the object was that you were placing it in front of needed to be offset toward the camera a little bit. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, this is a short and simple continuation. Um, it also adds another retro based uh, rendering technique that is used across a multitude of games in this space um, and also shares another way for like if you are working on a VR or a mobile project, how you could do an additive material billboard for uh, lighting effects that you may have to potentially fake for that target platform. And then, um, yeah, we'll just hit control P here real quick. And um, you can see that we're, you know, even within this space, we're not dropping frames too bad. And even with all these lights really piled up on each other, um, we're still well over 150 frames per second with Lumen GI now and, and dynamic lighting, a fully dynamic lit scene. Um, yeah, remember to hit that like and subscribe button. I want to say thanks to all my Patreon members and the entire Wild Ox Studios YouTube family. Thanks for joining if you have already. If you haven't, think about joining because that's what allows me to continue to do things like this. Um, take you guys' request and keep coming out with awesome content. Until next time, guys, happy developing and toodles.